going to talk about the end times, discerning the times, part two. If you turn back to Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 51, and stand for the reading of the word. Father, we come to you and thank you and praise you that nothing should be a surprise to us, that you have told us clearly everything that you're going to do and everything you're not going to do. So we should be the most well-informed group of individuals on the face of the earth. And we thank you and praise you, God. These are not scary times. These are times of opportunity. These are times of kingdom advancement. These are times of making a difference for you. And we thank you and we praise you for it. Help us to see it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Starting in verse 51. I forgot. I've got to have cheaters now that they fix my eyes. I'm not sure how that works, but uh, now that they fix my eyes, I've got to have cheaters. Jesus said, do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five and one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be a hot weather, and there it is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern the times? May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seated. So, So basically, Jesus is saying in this passage, we really have no excuse for not discerning the times that we're living in and understanding them. In verse 56, we just read, he said, you can discern the face of the sky and the earth. How is it you can't discern the spiritual times that you're living in? In Matthew 16, 2 and 3, to the Pharisees who asked him to demonstrate another sign to validate his claim as a Messiah, he said, he answered and he said to them, when it's evening, you say it's fair weather. When the sky is red and in the morning, it will be foul weather today. For the sky is red and threatening and hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. In other words, you've done a poor job of prophetic preparation, and you're the people of the word. You're the people who are supposed to know the word. Remember on the Emmaus walk, whenever, on Emmaus, whenever he had the two, he had been crucified and resurrected, and he was walking along the path with the two disciples, and they were in mourning because... Didn't you hear what happened? They crucified. We thought he was the one, and they didn't recognize him. And he stopped them, and he said, Hold on. Ought not that to have happened? Isn't that been written in the Scriptures? And he began to teach them in the Scriptures about the prophetic things that will happen when Jesus comes to the earth the first time. My job is to teach you from the Scriptures the things that will happen when Jesus comes the second time and before he comes and the preparation for that. And, and we can't ignore these things. They're happening all around us. And there's, there's, there's just no excuse for us not to be prepared. There's overwhelming prophetic evidence that we're living in the end times. Number one, what is end times? Is that the end of the world? No. Is it the end of time? No. Christ will reign for a thousand years after, we get, after he comes back here. That's the end of time. That's after a thousand years. He's been here for a thousand years. When, when Jesus, when, when the scripture says end times, it's talking about Luke 21, 24. When Jesus said Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It's all about Jerusalem. It's all about Israel. It's all about the temple. It always has been. I know we think Texas is a pretty important place. But in the prophetic times, Texas is nothing. It's all about Israel. It's all about Jerusalem. And it's all about the Temple Mount. And it always has been. And so he's saying that there is an ordained period of time when the Gentiles will trample over Jerusalem. They'll control it, control parts of it like they do now, and that will come to an end when Jesus comes back. So what are the signs of his coming to restore God's dominion over Jerusalem? Well, one of them, and it's an important one, is the apostasy of the church. What's that mean? 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. The Greek word interpreted as falling away here is apostasia. It means to turn away, to rebel, to abandon, to apostasy, rebellion. 
We get so aggravated when we turn on the TV and we see the church, parts of the church, big parts of the church that have totally turned from the truth of the word and they begin to ordain homosexuals or they begin to do things that are clearly, clearly against the word of God. And we go, how could they do that? Here's my answer to you. How could they not? If Jesus is coming back, that's part of it. Don't get mad. Go, well, I recognize the season that we're in. This is what happened with the Pope on December 18th when he declared the, the, he gave the Catholic Church permission to bless homosexual relationships. Well, bingo. That was the next piece in the puzzle that tells us that Jesus is coming back. Consternation around Israel is another one, and specifically Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. This is earth-shattering to some Christians, but for Jesus to come back, Israel has to actually gain control of the Temple Mount and rebuild the Temple. That has to happen before Jesus comes back. Well, you know what? How's that going to happen? Oh, the Arabs are going to all get drunk at a party and they're going to tell them, hey, we just, we're going to give you the Temple Mount back. That's not going to happen that way. It's going to be war. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a devastating war that's going to cause the Arab nations to relinquish their claim to the Temple Mount. Man, that's pretty big. Is that going to happen tomorrow? I kind of doubt it. I think that's going to take time. Do you think it's going to take time? I mean, let's, we're, history doesn't just unfold overnight, but we're living in the shadows of that happening. Amen. So, and the, the fifth thing is the increasing animosity towards the remnant church, the church that holds the biblical truth. This was also predicted. In Luke 21, 12, Jesus said, but before all these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, deliver you up to synagogues and prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But in 13 through 15, he says, but it will turn out for you as an occasion to give a testimony. Oh, that's fun. Can't we do this a different way? Therefore, settle it in your hearts. I'm going to encourage you this morning. You need to get it settled in your hearts. You need to decide you're either all in or you're not. Lukewarm is the worst thing that could happen to you in this time of your life. Well, I've made mistakes. I've screwed a lot of stuff up. Who cares? Jesus doesn't care. Repent and go all in. Come on, somebody. Repent and just go all in. Therefore, settle it in your hearts. Don't meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I'll give you a mouth of wisdom, which all of your adversaries will not even be able to contradict or resist. They'll be shocked. They'll be shocked when you tell them how it really is. Now, you can say, historians will say, well, this happened during the times of Rome and the persecution in Rome. I would say this to you. It's, happened, it's been happening to Christians ever since Jesus ascended back into heaven. There's been persecutions for real Christians that are really sticking to the word of God. There's always persecution. That's part of it. That's part of the fun. That's why we don't have a full church in here. We only got committed people in here. Amen? Come on, somebody. Settle it in your heart. You're not going to, you're not going to, just because you see large church organizations apostatize, fall into apostasy, that's a sign. That's not something you should follow as you, you're not going to follow them into that apostasy, but you're going to say, well, we knew that was going to happen. Amen. So here are seven keys to living in, in times that I think that we need to understand. There are seven things. Two of these we've already gone over. Number one, understand the duration of this season is much, much longer than you think. Don't make the mistake Joseph did when he got the vision of, of, of reigning and ruling over his brothers. And it took 40 years to bring that to pass, by the way. And, he, and the mistake he made is he thought it was going to be tomorrow. So this is going to be, this is, the, this is what, remember the virgins, the ten virgins? Five of them had plenty of oil. But, and, and when he was delayed in his coming, say delayed. When he was delayed in his coming, they didn't run out of provision. The other five quit making their house payments because Jesus was coming back and they all got thrown out on the street. No, that's not what it says. But maybe that will help you understand. They way, way, way underestimated the length of time of this end times season. They underestimated and thought he was coming quicker than he was and, and they became disillusioned and they missed him. So... You have to be understand this could be for three or four or five generations before Jesus actually emerges and returns. And when he does, it's going to be good, not bad. It's going to be good. 
the signs of the emerging Babylonian system that we <clears throat> and how to avoid getting tangled up in it. The, the, the Babylonian system, the one world economic, religious, commercial, I mean uh, political system is emerging now. Now, it's a long ways from coming, but we've got all of the stuff we need. We just need some AI computers. We've got that. So we can manage all the world's systems from one central location. Well, we can shut you down. I talked about, it's funny, I talked about the digital currency. They're going to start to push a digital currency on you. And Roger sent me a thing this week. A commodity guy that he subscribes to talked about how the Federal Reserve is pushing this digital currency. And I'm not sure, I know this guy's, uh, he's not saved, I know. In fact, he's a Jew. He's kind of a cussing Jew, if you know what I'm saying. He's not, he's kind of a secular Jew. But he, he, he sees the signs, and he said, do not get mixed up in this. Because when you go out and do something or say something they don't like, they're just going to flip the switch and you're going to be broke. They're going to drain your account. And so this is the one world system that we're seeing emerge. And we talked last week about, uh, Revelation 18, 4 talks, Revelation 18 talks about when Jesus is coming back to destroy this Babylonian system. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her Babylon, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. And I made the comment about who could that be? Because whenever Jesus finally restores the Babylonian system, the mark of the beast is already part of its function. You have to take the mark before you can buy or sell. And and the scripture surely says if you do that, you're not in the kingdom, you're out. And so how can my people be in the system? And I tried to make a point to you that you're in it now if you owe a lot of debt. I said something else too that I realized could be mis misconstrued. I'm not debt free, but I've got my debt at a very manageable level. Come on. If I had to sell stuff, I could pay it off. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Debt's not evil. It's just dangerous. And if you get debt, your debt ratio is up too high where 75% of your current assets, this is an accounting term, and, but 75% of your current assets uh, are in bondage to somebody, you're in real trouble. Because you can't liquidate fast enough a lot of times. There may become a time when things would happen. I just don't want to be in bondage to the world system, but I don't mind borrowing a little money to do something God's called me to do. A little debt is not bad. A lot of debt is dangerous. Amen? And we live in a time, if you're going to do anything, you're going to have to borrow a little money to do it. And, and so I have, Christian, I have a Christian banker. I bank at a Christian bank. They have faith and family right under their motto. I think that's a good thing too. Now, does that mean that they're perfect? No, it doesn't mean they're perfect. And they're embedded in the Babylonian system. If they're in the Federal Reserve, that's the Babylonian system. They're embedded in that. But it's different when you talk down and you sit down and pray with a banker before you sign a note than when you just walk in and he has, says it's ready here, all the money you need, just sign up right here, man, have a great day. And then six months, he's demanding payment. You with me? I like to, do with, I like to deal with Christian bankers. I like to deal with Christian uh, uh, doctors. I like to deal with Christian nurses. I like to deal with important people that are very important to my well-being. I want them to be kingdom people, led by the Spirit of God. I love doctors that pray before they do surgery. I love those guys because they're humble enough to know they need to ask God. They don't know enough. They have to have God telling them and showing them what to do. So you get the idea. The Babylonian system, and we talked about in Matthew chapter 25, so is not, so you go, well, we just need to live in a cave and eat pork and beans and not, no, no, no. But Matthew 25 says that you need to get, look around for opportunity. And he gives to each one in accordance with their ability. God needs you to multiply. He needs you to increase. He needs you to do it now. Because as the people come to Goshen, and the healed land is Goshen, and if you don't believe that, you're not paying attention to the news. All the big cities are in trouble. Can I get a witness? People are leaving there like rats leaving a ship, a sinking ship. And where are they coming to? They're coming to the rural areas like the Texas Panhandle. They're coming to the places uh, like, like our area. They're coming here Why are they? because they're after peace. They don't even know how to get it. They're just looking for peace. If you've been in San Francisco, California recently, you've got to be stunned. There are, there are, there are, I was watching a basketball game and a famous announcer, he's kind of known to say what's on his mind. And if I told you his name, you'd recognize it instantly. But they had a game in San Francisco and he just said out of the blue, he said, somebody clean this city up. Drug paraphernalia on the streets, homeless everywhere. 
Drug addiction. Here's how they solve drug addiction. Provide the drug for them. My God, how much. That's called deception. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. They're just totally deceived from reality. So they do stupid, stupid things. And most of them got college degrees with a lot of initials behind them. And they're completely deceived about the reality they're living in. So Matthew 25 says, in this season, you need to go out and invest. You need to watch for opportunity. You need to grow your business. Your business is growing. You need help. You got more business than you can take care of. I mean, I've, been, I've, I've, I've sent you several people. And they said, man, I love that brother. I want him to come do my stuff. But man, he's so far behind. That's what God wants you to be. He wants you to be far behind. He wants you to be going as fast as you can go. He wants to send you people. He wants to send you resources. He wants you to start businesses. He wants you to get positive. What's happening to them ain't happening to you because you're living in a different reality than they are. And there's a transference of wealth that's now happening where he's transferring the silver and gold is mine and it's coming back into my house. That's what he told us six years ago. He said, he said, the shaking is coming. I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. And he says, you get ready. And he said, get to work for my spirit is still with you. Don't you be scared like they, they got a new COVID they're talking about now. Well, they've been slipping. They've been losing control. The last COVID's kind of wore off. People, you know, people tell you, so, you know, I got COVID. And they go, oh, well, come to work anyhow. <laughs> Nobody's afraid of COVID now. Right? Are they? Am I telling the truth? Got to count you got to create a new variety if you're going to control people. This sounds cynical, but it's really the way we're living, I believe. It's the, it's the rise of the Babylonian system. So he needs Christian businessmen. In Matthew 24, 45, he says, Who then is faithful and a wise servant? It's the one whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant who is master when he comes back and he finds them so doing. God wants to entrust you with things that produce income that cause you to be in a position to help people. I don't care whether you drive a Mercedes or not. It's really probably not a very good investment. I understand Toyota's a whole lot more reliable than a Mercedes. My point is, it's not about the stuff. It's about having and putting yourself in a position where you can help people, where you can help them with their rent, where you can help them have something to eat, where you can make an influence, be, be an impact. It's, it's hard for poor people to impact and influence people. And I'm not saying they can't. Some of them can just because of their spiritual condition. It's not about the money. It's about the opportunity to help others. He wants you to carpe diem, seize the day. That's Latin for seize the day. He wants you to, things are shaking and there's opportunity. He wants you to take it. So here's the third thing. Signs of the emerging Babylonian system, how to stay out of it. Number three, discover and walk in your assignment. Can get busy because evangelism and disciple making is about to go into hyperdrive. Let me say that again. Evangelism and disciple making is going into hyperdrive. We're about to see the church begin to advance at a terrific level so fast that nobody even can grasp what's happening because in Psalm 130, because the church has got to start teaching people to do their assignment. Just, you just do what you need to do. Look, when you play football, Bill Belichick is one of the greatest football coaches in the history of the NFL. And here's his motto. Just do your job. Don't try to do his job. You do your job. And let him do his job, and we'll win the game. I'm saying this to Christians. Just do your job. Whatever it is, whatever mountain God has planted you on, excel at that. And you, even though I don't know how God can be using this. He'll use it. He'll show you later. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Psalm 139.16 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and it, in your book they were all written, the very days that you had fashioned for me, and when as yet there were none of them. There's a book in heaven that has your name on it. I've said this over and over and over again. There is a book in heaven that has your name. It doesn't have my name on it. It doesn't have Barn Church's name on it. It has your name on it. And when you get to heaven, he will open the book and review, did you do the things that were created for you to do before the beginning of time to get the church through the last days? No, Lord, I just couldn't see no, I couldn't see no spiritual thing about building houses. People got to have a place to live, don't they? 
Are you with me? Don't underestimate your role. Just do what your job is and let everybody else in the church do theirs and you'll begin to make a huge difference. The seven mountains vision in Isaiah 2.2. Then it shall come to pass in the latter days. Say latter days. That's what we're talking about here. It shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the other mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations will flow to it. It's a vision received by three great Christians, Lauren Cunningham, Bill Bright, and Francis Schaefer. They're amazing individuals back in, the, back in the 80s. That's been how long ago? See, we underestimate the time. But he said in the latter days, when you see the end times, you see all these signs, understand that you've been planted on a mountain. And here are the seven mountains. Here's, here's a list of them. Arts and entertainment, business, education, family, government, media, and religion. These are the mountains of cultural influence. And if you're, a, if, you're a, if you're an educator, and we have a lot of teachers in here, we really, really exalt teachers in here because I believe it's the most, they're, they're on the point of the spear for this season that we're in and the influence on the youth. But wherever it is, you be good at that. We talked about last week, John Harbaugh wins uh, the divisional round of the, uh, the coach for the Baltimore Ravens, wins the divisional round, beats whoever it was, I don't know who he beat, but was it, whoever it was, goes to the microphone at the post-game conference, and they ask him, you know, said, how does it feel to win? How does it feel to be a winner? He opens up the Bible and reads out of Psalms, all glory goes to the Lord. He, he read out of a Bible. Don't you know they started squirming when they saw him get that Bible out and open it up? But they had to listen to him. You know why? He's on top of the mountain. Now, they don't understand nothing about theology, but they know that dude is one good football coach. Come on, you get the principle? You become good at what you do, and you have influence. If you're lazy, and you don't do a good job, and you're not motivated, and you're just somebody nobody wants to hire as an employee, who in the world are you going to influence? But when you become good at what you do, come on. So, one of the things we need to do is we need to get dominion on the mountain that we're established on, where God has planted us. We need to rise to the top. He'll help us. Number four, stop trying to make the world like you. Would you quit trying to make everybody your friend? This is kind of a Christian thing. We love people because that's what God's put in us. And we want everybody to be lovely. Not everybody's lovely. Amen? And we want everybody to appreciate us and like us and know that we love them. Most of them don't care. I'm just being honest as I can be. The truth of the matter is, though, that that's okay. We're not, we're not angry at anybody. We're not, we're not mad. It's just that Jesus didn't come here to bring peace initially. He told you it would cause division. When you stand for him, you're going to get criticized, made fun of, called a heretic, whatever. But when you go to the podium at the big game that you just won, and your players love Jesus, they know you love Jesus, they all love Jesus together, they pray before every game, and they really mean it, and they go out there and they kick some you-know-what, well, the world goes, well, he's okay. See, if we just expect people to just like us, that's not going to happen. Because you represent something to them. He said, settle it in your hearts. Luke 21, 14 and 19. Settle it in your hearts. Beforehand. Know what you will answer. Don't compromise. Don't compromise your faith because people don't understand you or don't like you. You know, when I first got saved, I ran around with a lot of guys that were great guys. We roped a lot together. We drank a lot of beer together. And... Uh, when I got quit, when I got saved, I got quit getting invitations to come practice with these guys. And uh, I thought that was strange, you know, because man, we went to, we went to rope, just rodeo together and all that stuff. And so I didn't think too much about it. But then one guy said, "Hey, we're going to practice. We were going to rope together in Albuquerque. He's a big roping, and he wanted to rope with me because we had won before together. <laughs> it's his principle." We had won a third, biggest team roping in America. We had won a third the year before. So he's going, he's weird, but man, he can really head. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
So he said, what's practice? Come out and practice. So I said, yeah, man, let's go out there. And the Lord, when I got saved, the Lord told me to quit drinking. Now, I'm, uh, he didn't tell you that, but he told me I could not preach to the cowboy culture and drink because that's their number one problem is alcoholism. And so, uh, so anyway, you've heard that story before. So I go out there to his arena. It's old times. And uh, these guys, they've been off around a truck doing something. Well, they were drinking beers, what they were doing. That's what I used to do. I didn't care. I got my horse out and got him warmed up. And I walked up to one of them to shake hands with him. I hadn't seen him in a long time. He hid his beer behind his bag. I realized they looked at me different now. That bothered me for a long time. And then I realized, wait a minute. I don't give a crap. I'm not going to live like that. That's not the way I want to live. I love those guys. I want those guys to have what I have, but I can't do it for them. They have to decide they want to do it. Amen? So we went to Albuquerque. We won a second that year. Now those guys all want to come around, want me to rope with them. They're going, hide the beer. Here he comes. But let's rope with him. It took me a long time to understand that I'm no longer like them and they don't really understand why. And it's not that they didn't like me. They just didn't know how to act around me. And I tried to cut up and joke with them and, and all of that. But <clears throat> stop trying to get people convinced to follow Jesus because they like you. That's not going to work. Here's how, this is what, uh, this progress will not be made through skillful debate. You can't get in a debate with them. This is what Jesus said about the rock that the church is built on. Remember that? Remember when Peter, he said, who do they say that I am? He asked people, said, you know, the disciples were out wandering around together and he stopped one day. They were having coffee in the morning or something. He asked his disciples, he said, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. And then he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the son of God. And Jesus says this. He said, Flesh and blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. The word there he uses, Petros. And on this rock, Petra, different word, close but different, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This has been one of the greatest misinterpreted passages in all the New Testament because uh, the Catholics thought he was saying that he was build a church on Peter. No, it was a different word. Petra, Petros means like a little pebble or a rock that you throw. Petra was like a huge rock of Gibraltar, a foundation. This is the foundational thing that I build my church on is this. Here it is. I want to break it down for you. You can't talk them into it. They have to have a spiritual encounter with a living God. They have to bump into Jesus and get knocked off their horse and blinded for three days. That's kind of extreme, but that's what happened to Paul. And, and, and to tell you the truth, when people first get saved, I can relate to that. They are blinded for three days. They've got to have the way that you win the lost is you pray for them, you witness before them, and then you wait for them to have a powerful encounter with the Spirit of God. Because God will not let you come into the kingdom through the power of your intellect. Intellect. That will only lead you into more deception. And Matthew 10, 38 and 39 says, And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. The word there for life is suki. It's the word of art. It's interpreted as soul in other passages. It's the, it's the self-life he's talking about. If you don't let me crucify you, I can't use you. You've got to die to self. You have to die to your ability to comprehend God because you can't. A finite mind cannot, in, cannot comprehend an infinite God. It can't never make sense to you. You've got to do what God says because you have faith in him. It's only by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And faith is the subject, the certainty of things hoped for and the evidence of things you can't see. And God says, if you'll, I'll bless you if you'll do this. And it makes no sense to you. And everybody, the smart people all around you, they go, that's crazy, man. You shouldn't try that. But you know you've heard God. Now, now you're becoming sanctified. Now you're becoming separated from people's opinions. Now you're becoming separated from what people think. And you're no longer seeking the approval of men. By the way, you cannot be a servant of Jesus Christ and a pleaser of men. 
If you're worried about people's opinions about you, you need to get rid of that bug right now because the devil will play that card to trap you over and over and over again. Man, when I was in business, I was a salesman. You could come to my feed yard and not have you feeding cattle and you'd be so broke you couldn't pay attention. But I didn't care. I'd get you a credit line set up at the bank. I could sell the banker. I could sell you. I could sell everybody. But that was built in a deal of I cared about what people thought too much. I had to be successful. I had to have people's approval. Man, is that dangerous in the kingdom. Come on, somebody. I got weaned of that the hard way. If you're going to be living these end times, if you're going to do the work God's called you to do, and if you're going to complete your assignment that only God has given to you, you're going to have to lay down the approval of men and worry about the approval of God. You're going to have to lay down your, 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 your trying to debate people and talk them into the, res, the, the existence of an almighty God, and you're just going to pray they have an encounter with the Holy Ghost. This is what... You don't, have, you don't have to be stupid. Colossians 2, 8 says this. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men and according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. There are a lot of philosophers around that tell you that they figured out how people ought to live. You run them to all these big colleges, all these major universities in the United States, and their philosophy departments, if your kid ever gets to go to one of those prestigious colleges, you tell him, if I ever catch you around the humanities or philosophy department, I'm going to send somebody to kill you. Because keep him in the engineering school, he'll make a great, he'll, he'll do great. But these philosophers that think they have figured things out, Christianity is not a philosophy. Christianity is not a philosophy. It's an encounter with the creator of the universe. And it makes no sense now, and it makes no sense when it happened to you. Because our God is not a reasonable God. He's completely unreasonable. You can't outthink him. You can't figure it out. You have to lay down that desire to do that, and you just have to live your life by faith. So the thing you need to do in this season, you just need to understand you can't talk people into it. Just live it before them and pray for them. Number, number five. Actually, it's number six. Refuse to compromise on truth and commit to the demonstration of the powers of the age to come. Luke 21, 14, therefore settle it in your hearts. Get it settled that you just are not going to do the things the world says are okay. You're going to do what the Bible says is okay. Hebrews 6, 5, for we have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God, the word of God and the powers of the age to come. When you, when you win the lost, it'll be because you prayed for them and somebody got healed. When you win the lost, it'll be because they see in your life something supernatural, something beyond natural reasonableness. You have to commit not to be persuaded, to be persuaded only by the word of God and his truth. And you have to settle it in your hearts and you have to say, I'm not compromising. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm just saying this is what I believe is truth. And number seven, you've got to follow the revealed will of God, the word of God, and it'll lead you to your specific assignment. How many of you know for sure, you're absolutely certain of what your assignment is from God in this season? Raise your hand. You absolutely know for sure. That's a pretty high percentage, actually. Think about seven of you. Most people don't have a clue. Now, I want you to go study this king with me. In, in 2 Kings chapter 22, there was a young man. He was eight years old. He became king of Israel because he was in the line, and there were kings killing each other. His parents got killed off, and he was raised by political. It's politics, just like politics today. And his, he got raised by priest. His name was Josiah. And you need to read the Josiah Manifesto by Jonathan Kahn. You need to read it. It's a long book, but it'll explain to you what we're going through now clearer than I ever can. But Josiah was eight years old and he became the king of Israel because he was the one in line. The priest protected him and they <coughs> coached him and he became a great king. When he was about 20, 21 or so, he decided to rebuild the temple. The temple was in a shambles. Nobody was going to church anymore. And the temple was in a complete shambles. And he said, I want to remodel it, rebuild it, fix it up. 
I'm going to start going to church. So they started working on it, and the carpenters were moving some walls around. They kicked the wall in, and they found the Word of God hidden in a scroll inside a wall cavity. Some, some priest back during the years of persecution decided to hide that where they couldn't because nobody had a Bible. Nobody had a Bible in all of Israel. They did not know anything about the Word of God because nobody had one. And they found it there, and they brought it to him and said, we found this in the temple. And he said, get somebody to read it. And when they read it to him, he ripped his clothes. He went into mourning and fasting because he realized how far the nation had come from truth. They had celebrated and were worshiping pagan gods. They had exalted sexual perversion as being spiritual. And he swore that he was going to bring Israel back to true worship and a true king. And he began to destroy as a, as a, as a, as an enforcer and a king now, enforcer of the word of God. Now that he had a copy, he reinstituted the Passover. That's one of the things the Lord still remembers him for is he, they, they didn't observe the Passover anymore. He reinstituted the Passover. He trained up a bunch of priests to conduct the Passover. And he decided to go to Bethel. Bethel is a sacred place. How many of you know where Bethel is? Bethel means house of God. That's where Jacob had had an encounter with the angel and the ladder when he was sleeping, when he was on the run and he was headed for Syria, when he was on the run from his brother Esau. It's when he saw that and got that word from God and he got the ladder that connected, that, that, and he, and, and in the vision he saw there was a connection between heaven and earth. It, it was a sacred place. And the pagan king Jeroboam had built these altars to these sexual gods, worship of Baal, all this other stuff in this sacred place. And when Josiah got there, he began to destroy them. I'm in 2 Kings chapter 23, starting in verse 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he was a king from way back who was corrupt, who made Israel sin, had made both that altar and the high place. Uh, he broke it down. He burned the high place and crushed it into powder. He burned the wooden image. And as Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain. And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs, and he burned them on the altar, and he defiled it according to the word of God, which the man of God had proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. A prophet had spoken this before. So look at verse 17. Then he said, What gravestone is this that I see? So the men of the, the, the city told him, It's the tomb of the man of God who came here from Judah and proclaimed these things, which you have just done today, uh, that you have done against the altar of Bethel. And Josiah said, let, let him alone and let no one move his bones. So in his bone, they left his bones alone and with the bones of the prophet and the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. So here's what he's saying. This is what this passage is saying. Josiah just started to read the word. He got a copy of the word. He just started to read the word. Then he started to do what the word said to do. I'm, everybody comes to me all the time and says, I don't know what God's will for my life is. Here's the, here's the pattern. Josiah just started to do what the word said to do and it led him to his prophetic destiny. And all of a sudden he shows up at Bethel and he starts destroying the, 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 the altars of the evil altars and the places of the perverted places of perverted of people and all of that. He begins to destroy all of that and they tell him there was a prophet who came through here hundreds of years ago and he said, you can defile this place all you want to but there's a king that's coming. Come on. I'm telling you right now, church, there's a king that's coming. And he's been prophesied for thousands of years. And Josiah looked around, he began to do the things that the word had told him to do and then it was validated, this validated that this was his destiny. This was his destiny to bring Israel back. How did he find and discover his assignment? By just doing the word of God. This is what I tell people all the time, man. Quit worrying so much about 
What's, I, God, I don't know what your will for me is. You put flesh in it. You don't, it's not about you, it's about him. Just do the will of God. Learn the will of God by a transformed mind. It's been transformed by the word of God. And this is the, this is the revealed will of God right here. Just do this. And as you do this, you know what will happen? You'll discover your specific assignment. This is the pattern from Josiah. God has something important for you to do, but you've got to just start doing what he says to do here. Amen. So, if you follow the revealed will of God, it'll lead you to the specific will of God for your life. Everybody's wanting somebody to walk up to them and say, Rusty, this is what God wants you to do in this season. God wants you to discover it yourself. Now, there may come a time that a prophet, a prophet will verify it. There's nothing wrong with that. But he was already doing it. And the prophet had told from thousands of years, hundreds of years before, he said, you're doing the right thing. So what's the will of God? That you love people, that you help provide for them, that you worship him above all other things, that you get rid of the idols out of your life. You all got one. We all got one. You'll start to worship it instead of God if you're not careful. You're already doing that. Get rid of that. That's all the revealed will of God. That you honor family as an institution and marriage as an institution. That you care about the sanctity of human life. You start doing those things, it'll lead you to the specific thing that God has you to do. So, here's number seven. Live a life that's abandoned to God's grace. Now, this is the thing that I think is so hard for us to learn is <clears throat> the wilderness was training ground for the promise. They had to go through the wilderness before God could trust them with the promise and develop the character that they needed. The manna of the wilderness was not provision. The manna of the wilderness was training. You see, you couldn't go get more manna than would just last you for one day. You had to learn to be dependent. I don't know, what are we going to eat tomorrow? I don't know, God will, shift, God will provide. You need to be in the wilderness and get real thirsty to where you get on your knees and beg God to give you some water. And then you strike a rock and the water comes gushing out. Miraculous. Until you've been through some times of testing and some times of, of doubt and times of wandering and wondering, until you've been through that, he can't vest real blessing into your life. You see, because if he puts real blessing into your life, you become dependent on it and you begin to worship it instead of him. The manna is training. The manna is not provision. It's training for the blessing of the promised land to teach you how to be holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy, dependent on him all the time. In good times and bad. See, it's harder to do in good times than it is to do in bad times. This is why you have to go through the wilderness in your life. Some of you are in a really dark place. You feel like everything has failed. You don't know where you're going. It seems like there's no, your life makes no sense. Welcome to the wilderness. It's in this place that God will perfect your carrier where he can, character where he can vest real blessing in it. No man or woman who has not experienced the wilderness will ever be capable of stewarding the blessing. Until you learn to depend on your manna every day, you're not going to be, he's not going to give you tons of anything. And so, <clears throat> when, you learn to, when you learn to live like that, you live your life abandoned, completely abandoned to the will of God. How am I going to get out of this mess? He knows, I don't. But I know I'm coming through. How am I going to get through this drought? He knows, I know. But I know he's going to bring me through. How am I going to get out of this real estate recession, depression? It's not a recession, real estate depression. 
I don't know. God does. But you need that to be able to steward the blessing that God wants to put into your life. I always get fascinated with wealthy men. I've been very, very blessed, I guess. I don't know why. I've gotten to know four or five truly, I would say three, three truly wealthy men. I'm talking about staggeringly wealthy. And gotten to know them well enough to minister to them. And they all got a story. They got a story when they don't, didn't think they were going to make it. Every one of them. Every one of them has a wilderness experience. I think that what we want to do is we want to run from the wilderness. Instead, we need to walk up to the edge of the wilderness and say, but God, and dive in. And learn to live completely abandoned to God in the wilderness. And dependent on him totally. And that way, when we become the rich young ruler, we won't do like he did. What do I do, Lord? What do I do get in heaven? He said to Jesus, and Jesus said, take all your stuff and sell it and follow me. And he couldn't do it. He turned. You know why? Because wealth builds a tremendous sense of self-sufficiency. And if you don't get broken of that, he can't trust real riches in your life. I heard a story about a real, real wealthy businessman that was part of Bill Johnson's ministry. And he would go to the altar every time the altar is open. He would go to the altar and he would be on his knees and he would be praying to God for something. And from the outside, it didn't look like he needed anything. And he and Johnson got to be good friends. And so he said, if you don't mind me asking, what is it? What are you seeking? He said, I'm begging God to give me enough provision so that all my employees will be able to put their kids through college. That's what it is to be blessed by God. Someone whose heart has a heart like that. That's who, gets, who prospers and multiplies in this age that we're in of increase. I know someone that y'all talk to who only has one heart and that is to be able to build housing for people that can't afford it. You think that'll happen? I guarantee it'll happen. When you get that kind of heart where you love people and you want them, you want to do things for the Lord that help people, you're living a wholly dependent life on Him. You don't care about the blessing in your life. You care about what you can do for others. Get ready. God's going to begin to open the door and pour that provision into your life. You can't come into the fullness of God or what He has for you until you learn to live a life of total abandonment to him. Completely abandoned. There was a time in my life when I had to be in control of everything. If I wasn't in control of everything, I got anxious. See, that's an absolute mirage. You're not in control of anything. But you convinced yourself you are. And what happens is you quickly learn when things spin out of control, you were just living a lie. You no more control of anything than Adam. And you've got to have that abandoned life to God. Some of you have learned how to live that. Where you've got problems, you've got mistakes, there are things that have happened you didn't expect, but you're living, you're living so dependent on Him because you've learned that you have to live completely dependent on Him. One of these very, very rich men I talked about, extremely rich, I love this guy. I know his problems. I know that being, let me tell you, wealth, when you get a magnet, there's a magnitude of wealth that's nothing but a prison. It's a prison. And he had a lot of struggles. And he asked me, he said, what do you think I should do? I said, just give it all away. Give it all away and trust God. He said, I can't do that. I know you can't. So does the devil. What would have happened if he had him? This guy was the largest depositor in the Bank of America. I'm not talking about giving away a car. You with me? I'm convinced if he had of those issues that he had in his personal life would have completely vanished. Amen? In fact, he kind of did give it away because he started to just give it to his children and kind of, you know, he started to take less responsibility. And, and uh, <clears throat> last time I saw him, I said, man, what are you doing? He said, I'm just playing with the grandkids. I'm just another hired hand. 
And he was happier than I'd ever seen him. So here's the thing. The wilderness experience is essential, man. It's where you've got to learn to live that abandoned life where you totally abandon God. And in this time that we're living in, this end times, you can't be worrying about, uh, you, got, you, got, you can't worry about things, problems. You, got to, you can't let those get you down. You've got to just say, God, show me what to do today. Today. I'm not worried about tomorrow. Show me what to do today. He'll put the whole thing together. And then finally, there's a thing that Navy SEALs teach. The Lord just kind of gave this to me. And I, I, was, I was watching a Navy SEAL uh, on, a, on, a, on a YouTube video, and he was talking about the first thing they teach you is never give up the higher ground. And then the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you need to teach that to my people. Don't ever give up the higher ground. You have a tactical advantage when you're on the higher ground because you can, you can recorner the whole battlefield. You can see what's going on. Another thing is, if you know anything about military warfare, an enemy that has to attack uphill is, is really vulnerable. You have the higher ground. And here's what the Lord told me. Don't let them drag you down with them. You have the higher ground. I've given you the higher ground. Maintain the higher ground. Don't get involved in fruitless arguments with them. Don't drag, let them drag you down to their level. Maintain the higher ground. Are you perfect? No. Jesus is the one that put you up there on that higher ground. Stay up there. Stay up there with him. And the other thing the seals tell you, if you ever give it up, it's twice as hard to get it back. God, do I believe that. Spiritual principle. If you ever let the enemy steal your position in the higher ground, you can come back, but God, it's much harder. Amen. In these last days, you keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep your focus on him. You commit. Settle it in your heart. You're not going to compromise on the word of God. You don't care what anybody thinks. You keep your eyes and ears open for opportunity to do things for the kingdom that will bring increase and in multiplication to it. I wasn't going to share this with you, but I'm going to. One of my goals, and I've never even told the elders this because I know they would approve of it. One of my goals has always been for this church to give away 90 and live on 10. That's what I would love for this church to do. This last year, we gave away 87. I got within 3%. And because we want to give it away. You know that about us. We want to give it away. But here's the thing. The more we give, the harder it gets to, to get dispensed because it keeps coming in so fast. Last year, this church gave away 80% of its net. What we net, we gave it away. I want it to be 90. We've got to pay our bills. You've got to be responsible. But you get my drift what if you could live that kind of life? What would it be like for you to live if you, could, if you made so much money that all you needed was the 10% and you could give the 90 to the kingdom? Amen. I don't want you to be scared about end times. I want you to look for opportunity. I want you to look for opportunity to grow, to increase, to multiply, increase your position, master your mountain, become the top of the top. 2% controls what 98% of the mountain thinks. Become a top 10 percenter. Quit worried about politics. God doesn't need politicians. Politicians is what got him crucified to start with. I mean, it's hard not to worry about politics when you get them as bad as ours are. But my point is, that doesn't matter. That's all a sign of the times anyway. When a man is deceived, does he know it? No. That's the brilliance of the strategy as far as the devil's concerned. So there's deception everywhere. You see things the way they really are. Trust that. Trust that. Don't let people talk you into or out of anything. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to speak this over this church right now. I speak increase. I speak multiplication. I speak mountaintop living. I speak influence in the name of Jesus. Massive influence. Even in when you think you're insignificant. You can be a secretary in a business, but when you're the best secretary in the whole bunch, they start, the boss starts coming to ask you what you think. I've had that experience. I've done that. You be the best caretaker of the elderly. By the way, Brooke, that's a calling. That is a very, very powerful calling. And I don't know of any greater need in our culture right now than that. And because I've been down that road recently, and I have such admiration for those that have been called to do that. Be the best. God will make you the best if you just decide you're going to be the best. Amen? 
He'll require you to work too. Oh God, that's terrible, isn't it? You're going to have to sow effort. Dylan cannot win the fraternity if he's not going to ride those colts from four in the morning till, well, I better make it eight. Eight in the morning till past sundown. Invest, invest. Don't be afraid. So this is my, uh, I'm, I'm done preaching here. Don't be afraid to invest in this season. You have a special anointing on your investments. Amen.